Welcome back to America's Commercial Real Estate Show. I am Michael Ball. This segment is brought to you by The News Funnel. Check them out for news that you customize for yourself. Well, today we're talking about emerging trends in real estate, the ULI PwC report that's very respected. People want to see it every year. That's what we're hitting the highlights on. Please welcome my guest, Mitch Rochelle, Byron Carlock. They're here in Studio One. And we're down to our final segment and to talk about some of the top markets because you know, real estate's local, and if we're going to skate where the puck is going, if we're going to develop, invest in markets that uh, show some promise, where's that? Well, let's give you the top five. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm really proud that my hometown of Dallas, Texas, is is the top this year, uh, followed by Brooklyn, New York, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, Orlando, Florida, Nashville, Tennessee, and then quickly followed by another Texas city, Austin, and then we go to Boston then Denver, then Charlotte, then Tampa, St. Petersburg. Those are the top 10 as it relates to the indices of the surveyed respondents as to where they would be, where they view those markets as investment worthy for 2019. And number 11 was? Um, you got it on your list. Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number 11. So how do these cities rate? It's a sneaky rate? 11. It's a sneaky 11. It, it, you know. Got in there. Yeah. So so how do these cities rate? What What's the criteria? So just, there's, just, a, there's, a, there's a high correlation uh, in terms of, and I'll be brutally honest, this is popularity contest. So mm -hmm. people, there's 76 possible cities and people check them. And they're not required to provide any rationalization for As why. To why they chose. They the just pick them, right? And yeah. we, one of the things we look at, you mentioned very top of the show, uh, and you said respected several times, which we we really appreciate that. Um, but we look at every year to make sure no one really put their finger on the scale and drove a specific city with like a get out the vote campaign uh, mm -hmm. within uh, ULI, and that's never happened. But what we do look at is. Uh, when somebody is new in the market, why? Who new in the top 10? And then we also look to see what they have in common, which I'll unpack in a second. Just a couple things that are interesting in the top 10. Uh, Tampa was 19 last year, mm -hmm. uh, and it's number 10. Uh, Denver was 23, but Denver's been in and out of the top 10, so that, mm -hmm. that uh, doesn't really alarm me. Mm -hmm. um, Orlando, 16 last year, new to the top 10, uh, number four. And Brooklyn, Beastie Boys, No Sleep Till Brooklyn, could play in the background, um, was 30 last year and it's number two. Let's just talk about wow. Brooklyn, because Brooklyn's an outlier. Yeah. Sure. Brooklyn, when we looked at it, it's all about what I just talked about. It's all about uh, last mile delivery, high concentration of young people, uh, not enough office space for those who actually don't want to commute into Manhattan, would love to live, work, and play in the same place. So there's demand for office space and there's increased demand for housing. And, and if you just happen to be in Brooklyn, you'll see nothing but cranes uh, in the skyline. Brooklyn looks a lot like Austin, Texas in terms of uh, construction. It's just a different uh, price point, but it's undersupplied for urban industrial, undersupplied for the right kind of uh, office. Tampa is an interesting story. Tampa is really all about the multi-year strategy, which has gone back several mayors in terms of rebuilding the waterfront there. The river walk in Tampa has been a game changer. The new uh, ice skate, uh, the ice hockey stadium. So it's really public-private partnership, driving infrastructure, which we talked about in the last segment. But if you look at all of them, there's things that they have in common, um, with a couple of exceptions. The volatility of employment um, and the intersection of that with employment growth. So those cities that employment uh, data is not terribly volatile and is growing tend to be the top cities. Uh, the other thing that they have in common is their experience employment growth, but they're also affordable. Uh, and one of the big factors that is new this year to that calculus is tax reform, because the low tax states, uh, the Texas's, the Florida's, are really becoming and Tennessee, Tennessee, Tennessee yeah. mm -hmm. and even Nevada with Las Vegas. Those are becoming places that people, when they're making a decision about where they want to live, it's influencing the decision. Uh, I spent a lot of time looking at the housing market, and I can tell you with absolute certainty that the limitation on state and local tax deduction is impacting 
real estate, residential real estate in high tax jurisdictions. So if that's the cost, the benefit is going to take place with net migration. Uh, Orlando is seeing net migration of roughly 70,000 people annually into Orlando. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of jobs there. There's a tremendous amount of employers. It's growing uh, its population uh, two and a half times the national population growth. And it's growing across all age cohorts. So it's not just young people. It's not older people who are moving to Florida. But the fact that it's a tax efficient place to live and a tax efficient place to do business is what's become very uh, attractive. So, mm -hmm. And Mickey but, Mouse lives there. So, right? so. Not Snoopy, though. Just to stick. <laughs> yeah. Byron said animation before. We just talked about two yeah. animated characters. So you see low tax jurisdictions uh, being there. You see a lot of youthful um, cities that are affordable to live in, affordable to do business. And that's the theme that's been happening throughout uh, the last five, six years of emerging trends, and it's continuing. And I'm often asked, what happened to um, Salt Lake City? What which, happened to Salt Lake City? Yeah, what happened to yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, Former congressman from uh, Utah asked me that question. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what happens is there's a lot of herd mentality here. We, I joked a couple segments ago about the guys that stopped talking about industrial. Uh, last year, Fort Lauderdale was in the top 10, and it fell back out again. What happens is uh, a lot of people like it, and a lot of people race to it, and then people feel like the trade's gotten crowded, mm -hmm. and then it sort of falls back in, in popularity and the ratings, which speaks to the durability of Dallas, Austin, Nashville, uh, Charlotte uh, in, in the top 10 rankings. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out another uh, trend possibility that we don't know what the full impact will be on city rankings and city investments going forward, but the new Opportunity Zone legislation and the formation of opportunity funds that begin going into blighted areas, um, sk skirted areas of cities where there may be a, a whole quadrant of a city that can be redeveloped under opportunity zone legislation and the attractive tax opportunities for opportunity fund investors will change some of these cities. Yeah, that's interesting. And we'll put a link to a show we did on opportunity uh, zones and it's incredible uh, tax advantages and, and potential future profits of these properties are held for 10 years or a new business. That's it's pretty incredible. So uh, we will have a link to, to this report. So you can look at all top 20 cities that, that Emerging Trends is picking as, as the kind of top markets to look at for investment next year. But before you guys have to run off back to uh, what New York and then you're going to where, Byron? Yeah, Memphis today. Memphis, all right, nice. So uh, some barbecue, right? Mm -hmm. So what about the favored sector? When you, when you interview folks, uh, what are the favored, maybe one or two sectors uh, industrial still hits the top yeah okay. yeah and it's really it's 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 indicative of the major changes we see in supply chain and logistics mm -hmm. um, uh, we're seeing multi-story industrial come back we haven't seen multi-story industrial uh, in decades <laughs> we said that to an investor the other day and he almost hung up on us <laughs> was like, wait wait don't it's big in japan yeah 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 it's big in japan so what's yeah. number two um i was gonna throw a, like a curveball in there in lieu yeah. of a number two which yeah. is repositioning retail indeed um there's a lot of a lot of your clients a lot of the viewers and who i've uh, been sort of fortunate enough to interact with over the years um, we're always looking for that you know, less crowded trade. Mm -hmm. Repositioning retail. We are under supplying retail right now. And I've joked and I remember being on your air with Ryan Severino mm -hmm. years ago when he said that retail was overbuilt and under demolished. But the fact of the matter, it's not as much demolition as it is repositioning. Repurposing. And right. I think uh, the love that retail needs is in the form of capital. And we talked earlier about the alternative uses of distribution, mm -hmm. solving last mile problems. Um, medical uses in the form of urgent care, other uh, services for young populations, whether they be you know the gym time kind of places. Uh, you know, I used to joke about all of the empty big box retailers that became uh, laser tag places, but don't don't overlook the importance of that in communities that are growing, especially when most retail um, developments are still parked five to one in a ratio and there's a lot of excess land a lot of um, changes that will come as a result of the way we move around with driverless cars and shared transportation mm -hmm. that can use up some of that land for higher and better use development. Yeah, and, don't, and, and of course some retail is still doing really well mm -hmm. uh, in, in a lot of markets. 90% 90, 90 yeah. of purchases are still yeah. done yeah. in store. Yeah, And, and, and the subsector that 
it remains really, really hot is the what used to be grocery anchored mm -hmm. is now drugstore anchored because that drugstore has mor morphed into really the, the go-to place. And the margins inside that box are very, very strong. So there's yeah. an impetus for many of them to continue to expand. You're also seeing consolidation in that industry as the healthcare industry becomes more retail. Um, and uh, I think look for more consolidation in healthcare that's going to drive more land use in retail as opposed to less. Final comment from you guys. Um, when, you, when you look at the report this year, you guys were heavily involved in it. Um, and now you're reporting on it or, or being asked questions about it and speaking on it. What do you take away from it? What should we take away as a, as a concept? Well, I think the, to me the biggest is space use is evolving. Mm -hmm. And the real estate community has the opportunity to respond to those, those changes and make money doing it. And that's why I like your development redevelopment recommendation. Yeah. I, I would say I'll, go, I'll end where I started, which mm -hmm. is if you look at 40 years of real estate, what has it taught us? Uh, it taught us that cycles come and go, but real estate survives those cycles. And if anything, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And commercial real estate investment has gotten stronger and stronger and stronger. It's democratized, it's global. Uh, there's something in it for everybody. And I think the recovery that we're in is gonna go quite a while. Um, so uh, Good. There, was, there was a 25 inning uh, baseball game once upon a time. Yeah. I think using nine as the benchmark is probably wrong. Yeah. And by the way, since I talk global, let's talk about cricket as a sport, which mm -hmm. I don't understand, but they had a nine day cricket match. So yeah. you know what? Sometimes if you- Cycles can be elongated. Cycles, you know, I couldn't imagine nine day cricket match. I couldn't imagine like a one hour cricket match. I'm <laughs> trying to get hate mail, but yeah. the fact of the matter is, you know, sometimes you use the right, the wrong metric, you're looking at it the wrong way. So. Gentlemen, great information. Thank you for joining us in Studio One today. Uh, Thank thrilled you, to be here. When are you building Studio Two, by the way, Mike? It's coming. It's okay. coming. It's, it's coming. <laughs> All right, and thank you for joining us today around the country or around the world. Appreciate your comments, appreciate you sharing and connecting with us and giving us your thoughts. Until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn, and laugh and join us for America's Commercial Real Estate Show.